Hello. So this is part two of chapter 14. And um, uh, in the last chapter, I was talking about European exceptionalism and how we need to be careful of that term and uh, cautioning you to read that chap uh, that section, uh, Issues in Doing World History, uh, rather than just skipping over it. Um, so the map you're looking at here shows uh, the Venetian trade network in the 15th century. And Venice uh, was um, the one of the largest, um, one of the most important uh, maritime forces. Uh, it's a city-state, uh, not a country, of course. Um, and city-states uh, were where that blue blob, this metastasized blob of mercantile class really um, take hold because the merchants um, basically run the cities in city-states. Um, so the pink lights here uh, show the extent of their trade network and it looks pretty impressive. Um, but think back to the first map that I showed you at the start of the other part of this lecture. This is still quite local. It's um, you know basically contained by the Mediterranean uh, with um, some trips up to the low countries up here, up to Flanders. Um, and compared to um, some of the other um, voyages um, taking place at the time, at the same time, particularly the Chinese voyages, it's limited. Sorry. Um, okay. So one of the things that the Europeans innovated at this time, we've talked about Europeans as innovators, um, is that they took sales um, from um, the kind of ships they used in the Mediterranean, across the Mediterranean, with big sails, which allowed them to go faster. And they combined them with smaller um, sails that allowed them to change course and direction very quickly so that they could get up navigable rivers, for example. And then onto these galleys, they stick a whole bunch of cannon, which makes them quite an effective trading machine. Um, um, they did use them for warfare as well, but very often to um, enforce um, um, safety, force people to uh, trade with them. Okay. But of course, it wasn't just the Europeans that are explorers. Uh, it would be completely wrong to have um, that impression of the world. The Europeans didn't really um, pioneer um, uh, trade. Um, the Indian Ocean world was trading far um, longer um, before uh, the Europeans got into the game. And these are some maps that you can look at in your, your chapter. Um, you'll see more detail. Um, so when we think about um, the maritime world, um, we think about three particular groups of people who are sailing, uh, navies, pirates and merchants. Um, and they do overlap in some ways. Um, so, and we also talk about them in terms of dichotomies. Um, so there's a state-private dichotomy. Dichotomy just means uh, one of two things, two opposites. Um, so you can be state-run or privately run. And the first example here, to just shut off my screen, excuse me, um, is of navies. Okay, so navies are usually state-owned affairs. Um, we have the war-peace dichotomy, and the more warlike are the navies and the pirates, as opposed to usually more peaceful merchants. But uh, as you'll read in the chapter, sometimes this gets a, a little blurry, particularly in Europe, because uh, the states are sponsoring merchants, but these merchant fleets are also quite heavily armed. And then there's unofficial and official. So navies and merchants can both be official. They can be state-sponsored, uh, but pirates are usually unofficial. They go the wrong way. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a map. Um, and we compare it to um, the first map of the uh, Venetians that I showed. This is the um, this is the um, Mediterranean here, and the Mediterranean is 
probably just about that big compared to the size and extent of the um, the voyages here which come from China through the South Sign China Sea, uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, up uh, and around India and uh, Sri Lanka, up uh, the Arabian Sea into the Persian Gulf, around and into the Red Sea and all the way down uh, the coast of East Africa. Um, stopping at the trading uh, city-states of uh, uh, Melindi and um, Mombasa. A really, really extensive undertaking sponsored uh, by the Yongle Emperor. Um, so the reasons that the Chinese go exploring uh, and trading are quite different from those of the Europeans, and you'll see this in, in reading the chapter. Um, the Europeans are looking for resources. The um, Chinese are looking to impress people with how awesome they are. Um, they send out these treasure fleets, as they're known, and this is one of the treasure junks, and this is the size of it compared to the size of the largest ship of Christopher Columbus. So it's massive in comparison. And they... Um, take out treasure as well as bring it in. Um, one of the patterns and principles, if you always read the things in the margins, and this in the book, so one of the patterns and principles is that he who gives the most is the richest, that he has is shown power by giving. And that's a very, very different way of looking at the world from the way we look at it today, which is, um, unless you get to the level of Bill Gates and his um, philanthropy, I guess it still applies a little bit. But most of us are looking to suck in wealth, not give it away to show what a rich person we are. Um, so, but by sending up the treasure fleet, I mean, they're so impressive. It's the biggest armada um, that the, is assembled in the world until um, uh, the 20th century. Uh, it would have terrified and impressed as it rounded the corner and sailed into a bay. And they're giving away some presents, but they're also sucking in a lot of tribute from people. So their reasons for making these voyages are very different. And therefore, their reasons for ending the voyages are n not the reasons that Europeans would have had. Um, it's not necessarily that they're not making a profit. It, it's this change in culture in China, which becomes much more attached to Neo-Confucianism at the time. And so they want to return to more traditional ways. And part of this is turn its back on other peoples. They don't actually need anything from anywhere else. I mean, these are the, the guys at the top of the game in terms of luxury goods. People want things from China. They, China doesn't necessarily need or want anything from anywhere else. Um, so they stop Chinese merchants from being able to leave the country. Uh, when foreign merchants do come to China, they have to stay within special uh, enclaves in the only allowed in certain cities. So it's really a closing down of China to outside influence because outside influence is thought to be um, um, unacceptable. It's going to weaken China. So this is, these are the reasons they stopped their voyaging, uh, not in any way that they were technically um, uh, less advanced or that Europeans had any seafaring power um, over the Chinese in any way. And this is an Ottoman war boat. This is not, you're not going to get a lot of goods on this if you think about the size of the Chinese treasure fleet and how much stuff you could put in a hold that size. Um, this is kind of full. And this is because it's a war boat. And this is how the Ottomans thought about navies. They were for war. They weren't necessarily for trade. They did have small trading boats as well. But m their maritime interest was mainly uh, military. Um, so you're looking at here a map of Vasco da Gama's voyages to India. Uh, truly a phenomenal undertaking and rounding the Cape of Good Hope was extraordinarily um, difficult and um, in some ways this was the more important voyage at the time uh, than Christopher Columbus's voyage because what the Europeans really wanted was a direct route to uh, Chinese goods um, and 
Africa was in the way. They had to get around Africa. Uh, the other way, Christopher Columbus's way, was very risky and a little bit of an odd idea. But of course, that was the one that paid off in the end and the one we're all more familiar with. Um, a giraffe. <laughs> um, so just to reiterate again, just how, um, you know, when we're comparing these navies, um, as Vasco da Gama's ships come back from India, they're very small, but they bring back enough spices uh, to cause a sensation. Uh, in order to get spices before, they have to travel through many, many, many hands uh, and through Muslim intercessors into uh, Venice and then spread up their land networks from there and really expensive. When Vasco da Gama sails directly back with a ship full of spices, um, the, the price difference was really worth the, the danger and the effort of sending a boat. Um, so that's what the Europeans are bringing back. The Chinese bring back a giraffe. Okay, that's really quite a strange thing to bring back from East Africa. I'm going to East Africa, I bring back a giraffe. Obviously, this isn't for sale. This is for the Yongle Emperor. This is for his menagerie, his zoo. And it's to show just what an awesome bloke he is, that he has this power and this wealth, that he can bring back such an exotic animal. OK, so just to underscore this difference in the reason for trade once more. And finally, the trade networks and how networks and hierarch um, networks and hierarchies intersect. Yes, I got it right the first time. So this is China and you can see the size of the a hierarchy here uh, compared only really to the Ottomans, slightly less by the Indians. Uh, so these are the these are the power brokers of this world. Okay. Over in South America you have the Aztecs and the Incas as well. Europe is a bit messy, as is as is Southeast Asia too. You want to make that point too. And these two places are kind of similar in some ways because they have um, a network of small competitive kingdoms. Um, so the hierarchies are smaller. Okay. And so this doesn't really look like this would be the place to really come to dominate. Um, the um, maritime world. And remember, these, these kingdoms are not working in cahoots. Uh, they're not, there's no European exploration zeal that they're all um, sort of um, working towards. They're actually competing and fighting each other as well. And so you can, you know, um, if you've ever watched Pipes of the Caribbean, you know how much fighting is going on in that particular corner of the maritime network. Um, okay, so that's a very brief overview of the chapter. Um, after you've read the chapter, what you'll do is uh, also read the source book. And um, the sources um, for today deal with um, both the idea of what's happening in Europe and also um, this maritime world too. Um, so. The first two sources deal with this um, class conflict in uh, Europe. Uh, the Statute of Labourers is the first source, and that uh, tries to limit uh, the amount of um, pay increase, or what we call pay increase, uh, for peasants at, um, at the time after the Black Death, when their labour um, is more valuable because there's fewer people around. And then the second source is related, uh, deals with an account of the uh, peasants' revolt in England in 3081. Um, then we move on to our maritime section, and uh, we have um, um, an account, an inscription, which um, relates to um, uh, Chung He, Zheng He's voyages, um, and Muan Huan's um, overall survey of the Indian Ocean, which also um, shows just how technically advanced um, sailing was. And one of the things we don't often think about is 
writing things down, making maps, writing accounts of how you get to places and what the currents are like and how you park your boat and things like this. Uh, it's all very important. There's this wealth of knowledge that's building as well as important in innovations like the, the compass and the astrolabe. Um, then we have accounts of the first voyage of Vasco, Vasco da Gama, uh, where he sails um, up the African coast into India, and a letter from uh, Christopher Columbus um, back to um, Ferdinand and Isabella about his uh, discoveries. And then lastly, we round out our uh, sources with thinking about the European Renaissance and a source uh, from uh, Vasari, uh, who wrote this book, uh, Lives of the Artists, about um, how this innovation and tradition, remember this is the title of the um, chapter, is a little different in Europe. Because although Europe will say, oh, we're having a renaissance, we're looking, well, they didn't actually say that time, they said that afterwards, but they were looking back at a rebirth of the classical world. What they're actually doing is developing something very, very new and very, very innovative. Okay, that's it. Thank you.